it is my pleasure to invite Rita Shebeshwari, who is uh, the Deputy Director of United Nations University Institute of Environment and Human Security. Uh, beyond her many uh, positive features, uh, she was hired by me a couple of years ago when I was the director of UNUEHS, and I'm very happy that uh, she is now among the leaders of this institute. Zita. It needs Kepa. Make it. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for the very nice introduction. And uh, yes, uh, so the Institute's founding director is uh, Janusz Bogadi, and the Institute stands actually for looking into disasters, uh, disaster risk reduction, and um, evolving then also in, into climate change adaptation and transformation uh, processes. UNU, as a part of the UN system, does have a global mandate. Uh, particularly for developing countries, for developing nations, and uh, to, to uh, try to find solutions uh, which can uh, um, uh, actually uh, uh, help in, in that context. So I was looking into the uh, title of this uh, panel and also the description of the, uh, of the panel. Uh, I, I like the local. Uh, it was a word I never heard before, but I, I thought it's actually a good one to explore. And part of my uh, presentation will uh, deal with the local and what does it mean actually. Uh, also touching upon um, the UNFCCC uh, discussions around loss and damage and uh, the global goal and adaptation and what these global respons responsibility actually means. So when I looked at the uh, panel topic description, uh, the blue words are the, those which kind of ring, ring the bell and where I want to connect uh, with my um, presentation. Natural disasters, holistic solutions, interlinked challenges, global and local responsibilities. And please allow me to, to start with a cry out. So disasters are really not natural, and there are no natural catastrophes. There are natural hazards, uh, which then uh, uh, meet conditions of vulnerability, lack of capacities, uh, and uh, also exposure. So those are the combinations which actually lead up to a disaster. This means, means also that we do have agency uh, we as individuals, but also as a global community, we do have agency how to, how, how to deal with disasters. And that's already mentioned by uh, Professor Bogadi, so just uh, the recent examples what happened uh, in Turkey, but also if we are looking into Syria, I, I think we have a participants from, from uh, Syria. So what we see there is, yes, there was an earthquake, but the ultimate outcome is very much uh, co-shaped by uh, the abilities of the state to react and uh, to govern and to prevent uh, disasters and uh, to to deal with the disaster during the disasters happening and in the aftermath, also in the, in the recovery process. And um, if we are reflecting back of last year, where we ha have seen a lot of uh, disasters uh, around the world, just uh, thinking about the terrible floods in, in Pakistan, um, this is uh, where actually the global uh, climate change uh, interact with local vulnerabilities, um, lack of capacities, and uh, which, which also led to all this uh, um, enforcement of uh, calling for loss and damage uh, debates uh, in the course of uh, the last uh, COP, uh, led by Pakistan, uh, which uh, was the um, presidency, held the presidency of the G77, and uh, really putting forward the loss and damage agenda in the course of um, uh, the COP. So if you are talking about disasters and about uh, what's happening globally, so just the insured losses, which is just a so small part of what is happening worldwide, have been um, around uh, 120 billion USD in the last year, just the insured losses. And um, 
what we are seeing uh, in terms of disaster, this is then um, exacerbated by the cascading impacts, by the compounding uh, uh, disasters. So just to pick out some of these nine listed here, like broken supply chains or um, losses in productivity and losses in, uh, in, yeah, in life, but also in, in life quality, um, burden on health and, and resilience. And if you are looking into the last year, we see all the disasters happening and compounding still uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the consequences, uh, ripple effect of the, of the war in the Ukraine. So the year of compounding and cascading uh, risk, uh, this is a report from, from ReliefVet for, uh, for uh, Asia. So it's basically uh, seen around the globe and this is something we need to deal with, interconnectivity, complexity. So we just need to invest much more uh, um, time and power into understanding and uh, designing uh, responses which are um, not kind of not going into the um, luring um, options to, to design easy solutions because there are no easy solutions. So one of the uh, key messages of the uh, IPCC sixth assessment report one, was that these compounding risks are really the ones which are um, coming up, which we need to deal with. And one of those which uh, we see uh, strong effects is um, the compounding uh, risk of heat and drought. Um, but climate change also combines with habitat destruction, um, unsustainable resource use, and I think uh, the next speaker will uh, talk a bit into that direction, growing urbanization and issues of inequity global inequity, but also uh, inequity uh, locally, which plays out very strongly when it comes to the impact of a disaster. So there's one example I am bringing from, from Nigeria. I think there was a participant, Rafael, are you here? From Nigeria, but the example could be from anywhere around the world. So it's, uh, the, the example is, is big because it's, um, it shows uh, clearly this compounding effects, but this happening everywhere. It's happening also here, it's happening in Germany, it's ha happening everywhere. So what we are seeing here is uh, Lagos, uh, a city um, at the coastline of um, Nigeria, which is suffering from frequent floods. And the floods does have different reasons. So you have a lot of uh, torrent rain events, which uh, co uh, comes together with, um, with insufficient uh, wastewater and, and uh, um, uh, sewage uh, uh, system, so that there is a lot of flooding within the city. But at the same time, um, there's also a lot of uh, resource extraction around the coastline. Uh, sand is mined, um, usually as an illegal activity because it's actually forbidden. Uh, but a lot of sand is removed from the coastline so that the coast is eroding, um, degrading the natural protection systems against uh, um, sea uh, level rise and the storm surges, uh, what the coastline already now is seeing. Uh, so basically the flooding which comes from the rainfall uh, combines with flooding uh, from the sea and the outlook for the future is uh, quite uh, bleak uh, for the city. So when we are talking about uh, different kind of compounding risk. We try uh, to, to tell the stories of what is actually going on in a region, that it's actually a complex a compounding risk and that there are no easy solutions. So we do have the floods, we have uh, um, sinking um, uh, of the, of the um, uh, coastline, uh, we have uh, a lot of urbanization and growing uh, city and that combines together with this resource extraction. Uh, many people doesn't know, but sand is actually one of the resources which is uh, uh, getting uh, more and more scarce. Many think that, oh, there are a lot of deserts, uh, but that sand is actually not uh, suitable for construction work. So uh, the sand which is suitable for constructing, constructing houses, um, roads, uh, and so on, that's a, a particular uh, quality sand which you can mine from rivers or the coastline and that is actually getting uh, scarce. And where we actually still mine it, um, oftentimes leads to coastal erosion, 
or river bank erosion exacerbating other type of risks. And this is just one of the materials which is getting scarce on um, a time horizon which we actually can see already. And I am referring back again to the next speaker. So when we are talking about or looking at these uh, issues with a climate change lens, then we need to um, acknowledge that many people are in vulnerable situation and uh, adaptation progress is so far far from being uh, sufficient. So not enough is invested, not enough is known about ad adaptation, and the gap between what needs to be done and what is happening is getting um, larger and larger. Um, we try to communicate um, with different means. Um, so we, we have a science-based report which uh, uh, comes with technical reports, but then um, we are working together with designers, we are working together with, uh, with writers uh, to, to try to tell the stories, stories in a different way that they can be better understood and, and taken up. And if you would like to see some other examples, um, you may visit uh, this interconnected risk site. But coming back for this global and, and local, if you are a bit familiar with climate change adaptation and the research around it, there are some uh, so-called heuristics. So, so some things which are widely accepted and which you will find in all the reports or, or the scientific papers. And I really call out that some of these would need to be revisited critically. And one of those is that adaptation is a local issue. You will find this uh, widespread and uh, it basically says that um, adaptation is very specific to the local conditions and because of this, it should be locally led and locally governed and done locally, so to say, uh, which is true. Um, but the conditions um, which are shaping the space for adaptation are not local, they are regional or national or even global. And this is where I would like to connect to the to the current debate about the so-called global goal and adaptation, which is actually uh, within the uh, Paris Agreement, so 2015, the part of the Paris Agreement which has not prog progressed since, since then. Uh, where in Glasgow there was a commitment to look into the global goal of adaptation and where uh, workshops and negotiations are happening just right now and the, in the course of the last year and, and next year. And it's not yet clear where we are going with the global goal of adaptation, but I think, I think that it should be something which is aspirational, which shows us the way um, what adaptation should mean uh, in terms of justice, what adaptation should mean in terms of global responsibility, and do not leave it just be a local responsibility. And then finally, and this is my last slide, um, in many cases, uh, it's not enough anymore to, to change the system in an incremental way, to fix it a little bit here, fix it a little bit there, but we need to rethink the way how we use this planet, uh, because we simply do not have the time and do not have the resources just to continue and, and hope that uh, technological our solutions will, will us help out. And if it comes to uh, the scale of the change and, and the way how the change could be achieved, we really need to again think together the global and the local because change is happening on both ways. They can come from the grassroots and this can reach, so to say, the, the, the dominant regime, but uh, it uh, can come also uh, from megatrends and such as the megatrends was the pandemic and probably also the war. Um, and, and we need to see that, so to say, working together um, for our good, um, for, for trying to bring, so to say, um, us to a better pathway, which actually allows humanity to survive, I must say. And I think that's a, a good handover. Um, uh, the take home messages, if, if you just remember one thing, Disasters are not natural. We have an agency, humanity has got an agency. They are increasingly interlinked. They compound 
and there are no easy fixes. So whoever promised you an easy fix, um, look critically, because there are no easy fixes. We have to really uh, embrace this complexity because uh, otherwise um, uh, we will just uh, up for a maladaptive action, which uh, will turn out to be um, a dead end as well. Thank you very much.